We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Dan Popescu. He's a consultant and a gold, silver, and forex analyst. How are you today, Dan? Fine, Tom. How are you? Excellent. Excellent to have you. So before we hit record, you were sharing with me a story about the fact that the gold standard DPEG that everybody thinks about happening in 1971 actually started years earlier in 1959. So can you share with us a little bit of that history, please? Yes. After the Second World War, the United States led the Western world mostly, but the whole world into a new gold standard. With a trick, the United States introduced a link between the gold standard and between gold and the U.S. dollar at a fixed rate of $35 an ounce. So that's the system that was introduced in 1944 after the conference in Bretton Woods in the United States. It started to show weaknesses when the United States introduced its welfare program system And at the same time, they got involved into the uh, Vietnam War. And by 1959, it started to show tensions on this link uh, between the gold and the U.S. dollar. So the United States decided to intervene and put a lot of pressure on Europeans to create a pool of gold, 50% United States, 50% Western European countries, to support the dollar gold standard. And they created the London gold pool where a trading room was created in London to buy and sell gold to keep as much as possible the price of gold around $35 an ounce. And that pool started in 1961. It lasted and it worked until 1968. It was under a lot of stress And there was a lot of pressure from private investors, speculators in Switzerland. It was called the Gnomes of Zurich, the three major Swiss banks, Credit Suisse, Union Bank of Switzerland, and the Swiss Bank Corporation got together. And they convinced the South African mining companies and the South African government to join in attacking the peg between the dollar and the U.S. dollar. The attack, this Zurich gold pool, to counterattack the London gold pool, the London was official government pool, while the Zurich one was a private one, and they succeeded to crack and to break up this London gold pool, which had happened in 1968 when France just gave up, didn't want to use any more gold to support the U.S. dollar. And from 1968 to 1971, There was a flood of central banks that followed France. And the last one that came to the window was Great Britain. And that's when Nixon shut the window off the link between gold and the U.S. dollar and stopped converting U.S. dollars into gold at the fixed price of $35. That created a collapse of the U.S. dollar, which in the first five years from 1971 to 1976, lost 80% of its value as compared to gold. And then it lost another 10%, 12%, because now it's 92% down since the collapse of the gold dollar standard. And in 1990s, the United States wanted to replace the U.S. gold standard with the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar became very popular And the United States put pressure on the international community to sell their gold reserves and to make the dollar the only global currency. It failed. Europeans didn't follow the United States. On the contrary, they created in 1999 another pool called the Washington Agreement in which European central banks of the European Union and also At that time, it included Great Britain, but also Switzerland and Sweden created the Washington Agreement to support the price of gold. At that time, the price of gold was 250. It hit the low. Great Britain sold 
a large part of its gold reserve at, at its lowest price. It ended up by being called the brown bottom by the name of the Minister of Finance of Great Britain, the Shikir of Great Britain. And Europeans decided to support the price of gold to some level around 400. So the price of gold from 250 went up to 400 and continued up. And in 2001, the US dollar started to weaken, show its weakness. And in 2008, a crisis came. It's the 2008 financial crisis where there was incredible pressure on the system. Dollars were not accepted to interbank. Swaps between central bank, uh, the central bank of central banks in Basel, the BIS, started asking for gold as support. And from that point on, the Russian and the Chinese came in and started massively selling their U.S. dollar foreign exchange reserves and buying gold instead. And more recently, Donald Trump started a big treasury war using the dollar against other countries. And many countries started to de-dollarize, as it said, a process of de-dollarization. The European Union started to push the euro and Russia has completely, uh, not completely, but most of its foreign exchange reserves have been cut to about 20% and replaced with euros, yuans, and gold. And the Chinese are keeping secret their reserves. They are not updating it for the moment. I'm one of the ones who thinks that China doesn't have around 2,000, 1,950 tons, but it has more, something like 4,000 to 6,000 tons already, but on, on a different account. And recently, in the last few weeks, we have seen that Brazil has been doubling its gold reserves. The central banks of the Eastern European countries within the European Union, but not part of the euro area, have also started buying gold and selling the U.S. dollar. And yesterday, actually, on Twitter, I was reading that a software company, which should be favorable to cryptocurrencies, has decided to buy a large amount of gold and also to accept payment in gold because they say they are predicting some kind of a black swan event, catastrophic event. So all this shows that despite the efforts to make the dollar the international global currency, it is rather a return to the gold standard that it's uh, happening. So this is a resume, if you want, of the history of the gold standard, the Bretton Woods, which celebrated its demise of 50 years. It collapsed in 1971 and on August 15, and that was Sunday, it was 50 years. And it shows that the collapse is continuing and that we are moving in some way a return to some form of a gold standard. Dan, how hard is it for an analyst such as yourself to find reliable data to understand how much gold countries, like you mentioned, like China or Russia, actually hold and how to put that puzzle together? Oh, it's hell of a job. (laughs) The information, it's not available out front. We have to do a lot of hypothesis. You can also call it speculation. I call it a mosaic analysis. What is mosaic analysis? Uh, Financial analysts know about it. You get pieces of information from all kinds of sources. It could be technical analysis. It could be fundamental analysis, geopolitical analysis. You get pieces of information. And when you put a puzzle together, a picture comes out. So this is the way you do it, because otherwise the information is not straight out given to you. The gold market and also the silver market are very opaque. It's very, very difficult. I call the gold market like an iceberg. What you see the gold traded on exchanges or on future exchanges represents only the small one third or 20% of the iceberg, which is out of the water. The rest is hidden under the water. The gold market is enormous. People don't realize how big it is. In Asia, mostly, but also in Europe, there is a lot of gold that is being traded, exchanged, used as money, 
that never goes into official statistics. So you have to keep that in mind when you do analysis. It's very, very difficult to analyze. And besides that, there is a particularity with gold and silver is that it doesn't get wasted. The gold that has been mined for 10,000 years, you might have your wedding ring that you have might be eight, 9,000 years old. It has been melted, remelted, remelted thousands of times, but it has not disappeared. It has not been wasted. So the amount of gold that we speculate because we have no way of knowing the precise amount, it is between 190, 200,000 tons to 250,000 tons that exists above the ground. Out of all this, the most visible one, it's maybe 20 to 30 percent of the gold. Central banks hold at this moment about 19, 18, 19 percent. And that is what we know because Saudi Arabia doesn't publish on a regular basis. North Korea doesn't publish its data. Iran doesn't publish its data. I think I mentioned Saudi Arabia mentions it only after five, six years. And China does the same thing. Besides that, countries like Russia, they don't only buy for their official central bank, they also buy for other institutions like the National Wealth Fund. But it takes only an accounting procedure for the Bank of China or the Bank of Russia to transfer this gold from one account to another. And all of a sudden, they appear in official reserves. So the way to research it is to read extensively. And to put all that in context, but also don't exaggerate and go into all kinds of hysteria and all kinds of hypotheses that are completely absurd. So, Dan, I'd like to push back a little bit on something about the amount of silver that doesn't get thrown away, as you were saying. Doesn't some of it end up in, let's say, landfills and stuff like that when it gets used in electronics and those electronics are discarded and not recycled for the amount of silver that that they have? Yes, much more than in the case for gold, there is more silver wasted, but there is also an incredible amount of silver in households that comes out in period of crisis. I have lived in Eastern Europe in the 90s after the revolution in Romania and in Russia, where my uncle was an uh, expert in antiquities and people who needed money because the currency was completely devalued and the pensions were not enough to pay for medication for special operations that people had, they were trying to sell whatever they had in the house. So the most liquid objects that I saw with my uncle coming to be exchanged from some liquidity so they can pay for the doctor, the most liquid was gold jewelry and silverware. So I realized how much silver is in houses, in private hands, that people know they have it. You see, you don't throw out your gold jewelry or your silverware. You know exactly where it is in your house. And when the price of silver goes up, you always remember, hey, I have some silverware. I'm going to go and see if I can sell it. The difference with gold is that gold is maintained in the most pure form usually in jewelry, while in silver, it is maintained in art, in uh, uh, silverware, which requires a little bit more processing to come to market. So there is a bigger cost in recycling silver than it is in gold, but there is an incredible amount of silver that it is not recorded that is above. But there is recycling in technology, and even in photography, x-rays, who still use silver, a lot of it is being recycled. Because of the value of gold and silver, there is an interest to recycle it. So there is quite an amount of silver also that it is not easily quantified, accounted. I have some data from CPM group that gives an approximation, but you have to take those numbers with a grain of salt. There are approximations, but there is no question about there is a lot of gold and silver above ground stock in some form. And all it takes, it's a spike in the price of silver and of gold to come to market. So Dan, I'd like to go back to something that you were saying as well about, you know, this, in a way, this return to a gold standard. So who would benefit the most 
theoretically right now if we returned to something like a gold standard or gold backing of some kind? Well, first of all, we humans will profit because the currency will not be devalued through monetary inflation as it is being done now. I just gave you the example. If you had money stashed or uh, uh, received some money in 1970 in U.S. dollars, those U.S. dollars today have lost 92% of their volume. In the best fiat currency, it has lost in three francs. It has lost also 90% of its value. So uh, 98% in U.S. dollar and in euro, and the lowest one is 90% in Swiss francs. So the general public will, will benefit because we will have a unit of account that remains constant in history and in geography all over the world. One gram of gold is one gram of gold, contrary to currencies where you never know how much the currency is worth and if it will be accepted. So the general public will profit because it will be like the kilogram for people who live in Canada or in the rest of the world in the metric system compared to the American system, because today it's mostly United States that remained on the British system, uh, the pound. Now, try to imagine, Tom, that you go to the market to buy a piece of meat. You are at home and you want a certain size for your family. Let's say you are four in the family. So you want four pieces of steak of, let's say, one kilogram each piece. And by the time you go to the market, the store changes the size of the weight that they use to measure your meat, and they give you less meat. Well, if you do that, I've seen that in markets in Eastern Europe, and very fast it becomes a fight. People start attacking the store owner for cheating them by falsifying the unit of account. So the general public will profit. It stabilizes your life in general. It stabilizes everything because it will be a unit of account which is constant. And it has been this way for 10,000 years. So this is it's going to bring stability in life. I lived in Switzerland and I go regularly to Switzerland. Switzerland is one of the countries that has the lowest inflation in the world. It still has some inflation because it is being forced to import some inflation from the US dollar and from the euro, but it has the lowest monetary inflation. Now, the life in Switzerland, when I lived in Switzerland, the rents fluctuated very little because there was no need. The currency was constant. The currency was stable. Contrary to Canada, where I also live, where my rent is going up all the time, my taxes are going down, and they are saying they are inflation adjusting my rent. Okay, what is inflation adjusting? Is that the, the currency was devalued, and the owner of my apartment wants more money, the same amount of money, but which has been devalued. So it's good for everybody to have a unit of account that remains constant. There shouldn't be deflation. That's where the cryptocurrency are completely ignorant. They think that the more a currency increases in value by becoming rare, the better it is. No, for a currency, deflation is as bad as inflation. Because think about it, Tom. If a currency becomes rare because it has disappeared, like Bitcoin, because we forget our passwords, it disappears and the amount of Bitcoins circulating goes down, it increases in value, but as a unit of account, you are not going to use it. You are going to drop it because you cannot feed your family if you cannot get the currency. So inflation, as much as deflation, are the bacteria that kills any unit of account, any currency. Money disappears if you have inflation, because hyperinflation, very high inflation, it also disappears if it goes into deflation because you cannot find it anymore. You know, if I cannot get my money to pay for my food, then I'm not going to use that money. I'm going to find something else to use it. So this is why the gold standard has the advantage and it goes in sync 
And I wrote it on my Twitter accounts on Sunday on the celebration of collapse of the Bretton Woods system. It brings the unit, uh, the monetary unit in account back to the international scientific system of units, which is called the MKS or the CGS, uh, gram meter second or kilogram meter second. That means, because keep in mind, uh, Tom, we don't think about it, but for 10,000 years, the unit of money was not a fictitious name. It was the weight of a certain material, a certain chemical substance, okay? A standard chemical substance, the weight of it has been the unit of money for 10,000 years almost. Uh, In the old time, they used to take a bag of gold and compare it with a bag of tomatoes. So it was the weight of gold that was money. It wasn't gold itself, it was the weight. So the weight, which is a unit of account, the kilogram and the gram, is part of the international unit system that is recognized by scientists without which technology will not exist. So it will bring the unit of account back into the metric system of the world or the British system by becoming back again a weight of some physical chemical element. So that would be the advantage, in my view, of going back to a universal constant. Absolutely, Dan. And you mentioned cryptocurrencies there. And, you know, seeing, let's say, the the market react to this advent of a new, whatever you want to call them, system of account, store of value, as people are calling them, I wanted to get your thoughts around if cryptocurrencies are taking over the role previously held by gold and silver for a new generation of investors. No, Tom, it's the same story that repeats that happened in the 1990s with the US dollar. There was an academia, a group of uh, theoreticians in academia, economic academia in the United States that predicted that the paper dollar was the new currency of the universe and get on with the times. Don't be a relic of antiquity, they used to say and come back to the future technology, and the dollar is the currency of the future, the currency of technology. We don't want to carry gold in our pockets. The argument was used in the 1980s, it's uh, 90s. It's much easier to use paper and electronic dollars. And all this uh, garbage collapsed after 2001, 2002, and especially after 2008, financial crisis and the collapse of the dollar. And came a new idea from the internet anarchists to replace gold with, again, with something digital. The generation in the 1980s and 90s, they were saying, let's replace physical gold with paper gold, which would be dollars, okay? But based on nothing, fictitious units, of account because the dollar after 1971 became a fictitious concept based on nothing actually. So Bitcoin designed a mathematical formula of a code actually, which is just a software program and nothing else describing a concept, nothing, because keep in mind mathematics is not really mathematics, it's a concept of the human mind, okay? And uh, it is nothing real, so it's nothing cryptocurrencies. So the idea, it's not that bad to switch in the medium of transmission, of communication of the unit of account, which we moved from physical like gold, silver, and copper. Don't forget copper because copper was for 10,000 years as much money as silver and gold. We move from the physical form of it We move to the paper form of it slowly in the last 100 years. But the paper that we moved to still represented something physical. In the 1980s and 90s, Bitcoiners don't realize that, but in the 1980s, we went digital. It's not with uh, 10 years ago with Satoshi. It's in the 1980s, I switched to electronic money. In Switzerland, when I was in high school in the early 1970s, I was already on electronic money. It wasn't digital, it was analog signal at that time. 
But when I was going to visit my aunt from Lausanne, one city in Switzerland to another city, Neuchâtel, I could take money out of my account in Lausanne and it was transmitted through electrical current in the form of a signal that was analog signal. In the 1970s, late 70s and 80s, technology improved and went from an analog signal, but still electrical, to a digital signal, but still electrical. And in the 1990s, slowly, we switched to fiber optics, which is a quantum signal. It is not transmitted by electricity, by electrons. It's transmitted by photons, which is the elementary particle of light. And my colleagues, because this has been my specialty at university in physics, photonics, my colleagues who are still working in the field are working in the next generation of computers, which will not be digital anymore. The computer information, the computer that you will have on your desk will be quantum computer. It will not use electricity anymore for transmitting information. It will, it will use light photons. You already have that in the cables that brings the signal up to your room, but from the room into your computer, you need a modem to transform photons into electrons. But this technology doesn't change the concept of money. The concept of money is the same and remains the same for 2000 years since Aristotle defined it and longer than that. Okay, the fact that you are transmitting a poem on a horse and today you are transmitting through a space shuttle doesn't make the poem beautiful. If it is garbage, when you write it on a horse, it's still going to be garbage when you write it on a, <laughs> on a computer. Okay, so the technology behind money evolves. And when Bitcoin came out and I studied it extensively from the economic and also from the mathematical and technological point of view, I realized the value of the concept of software, which is called blockchain, and the concept of the definition of the unit, which is called Bitcoin. I dismissed the unit Bitcoin as being a stupidity, but I found interesting, not exception, exceptional, exceptional, but interesting, the notion of blockchain, of a coding and cryptically packaging information, which is a blockchain on which Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are based. So at that time, uh, that's about 10 years ago, I said, I dismiss Bitcoin, but I find the, the idea of cryptocurrencies backed by something like gold, as paper money was backed by gold, I find that interesting. So I think in the, uh, we see already the evolution. We see Bitcoin collapsing as currency and money and becoming purely gambling casino chips that are being manipulated by a very few people because 70 to 80 percent of the Bitcoin are blocked. They don't circulate. Only 10 percent to 20 percent is traded on manipulated exchanges with fake transactions, swap transactions that manipulated its price. And that has made Bitcoin run being displaced from, uh, uh, from the system as a currency, as money, 10 years ago. And it was replaced by what they called stable coins. The crypto people themselves understood that they cannot use it as money. So they designed a fiat currency backed concept, they called it stable coins, which was a kind of a cryptocurrency, a Bitcoin, but backed by US dollars, which are called tethers and, and all kinds of names that they, they, they are giving. And those crypto dollars are now dominating 80 to 90% of the cryptocurrency market. And Bitcoin is, has been completely marginalized and taken out of the cryptocurrency sector. It is only used now as a financial gambling instrument on the internet. Okay. It's a kind of a Ponzi schemes. More people buy it, more the price goes up, more people are. So you need all the time new suckers 
for the whole Ponzi scheme to function. The moment that the number of new buyers stops coming, the price collapses, the system collapses. So uh, cryptocurrencies will survive. And we see it already in China with the crypto yuan, but they will be controlled by the state. And it will be just a crypto version of the digital version that you have already of the U.S. dollar. And before that, the paper version of the U.S. dollar. Okay. The problem is that all those versions, technological versions, paper and analog, digital and quant, need something to be backed something real. What is behind this new digital currency? And that's where the question is, what will back this system? There are two ideas. They are both very good and they are very similar. But I think for simplicity, it is gold that will win. One is the one that Keynes, the economist Keynes proposed before Bretton Woods in 1944, And that was a basket of commodities, like the CRB basket of commodities, which contains about, I think it's 18 commodities. He proposed a unit of account based on this basket of commodities, which also includes gold and silver and copper, which used to be before that. But you can see here the complexity of the system to calculate on a second by second basis the value of this basket of 18 currencies. That's why I don't, I don't think it will win. The other one is to use gold because gold functions the same as the, other, uh, the basket of currencies. It's a real asset, but it's very simple to understand. It's just one chemical element and it's much simpler and it represents all the basket of commodities. Those are two concepts. I don't dismiss one or the other and there are different variations between them. It could be a basket that includes 50% gold and the rest other uh, commodities. Other versions uh, say only 20% of gold and 10% silver, 5% oil, uh, 5% copper. So those uh, concepts will be brought. But it seems to me that in real practice, in reality, what I'm observing because theory is nice, but reality is another, I see that gold is gaining momentum with central banks and with individuals more and more. As I mentioned at the beginning, central banks are buying in the last two years, uh, actually since 2008, they've been buying extensive amount of gold. Eastern European countries doubled their gold reserves and sold dollars in the last three years. Brazil in the last six months, has doubled its gold reserves. China and Russia said that it's going to buy about 600 tons. That's going to have a a big effect on the gold market. 600 tons for its uh, pension wealth fund, okay? And might restart buying gold for its official reserves. And China is hiding. And, And I forgot to mention India. India has been also recently buying gold. African countries have decided to buy their local mining production of gold and increase their gold reserves. So reality indicates to me that the central banks are not going crypto, uh, nothing concepts, but they are going into gold, but they will be using the electronic system as a payment system. So, Dan, as we look at the actions of these central banks and big institutions like Palantir, as you mentioned earlier, buying $50 million worth of gold, I believe it was last month, what would be the difference between a country that had a lot of gold in some type of, let's say, currency reset? Are the countries without gold, like, for example, Canada, that don't hold gold on the balance sheet, is that currency going to be left out to dry in some type of a gold reset? Yes. Because that's what happened in the crisis in 2008. Countries did not want, and they didn't want currencies. They didn't want US dollars or euros. They wanted gold. So you had an explosion of amount of swaps between central banks using as a guarantee gold. So who will have the gold will make the rules. It's an old saying, who has the gold makes the rules. So that is the reason why the Russians and the Chinese, and that's the reason why Europe, 
the European Union, which has the largest amount, it has more than 10,000 tons. And if you include the, not just the euro area, but also all the European Union countries, they have about 11,000 tons compared to United States, which has 8,000 tons. So it's about 3,000 tons more that European Union has. And India can depend also on the gold of its population because it is estimated that India has between 20 to 30,000 tons of gold in private hands. Now, all that is not available to the central bank, but there is a big pool of gold in India. So the argument goes for South Africa and Canada and Australia. Well, we don't have uh, above ground in a safe but we have a lot of gold mining, which is not a bad argument. The only problem, Tom, is that when crisis hits, what good it is that you have a house in Florida, okay? You need the money now. Let's say that somebody in the family has to have an operation and has to have it very fast in the next month. By the time you sell your house in Florida, it might take about three months, maybe a year before you sell it. So the liquidity that you have in your hands, that's the one that you are going to use in a crisis period. So foreign exchange reserves in currencies and also in gold, which is called the international reserves, their purpose are to be there in case of a crisis of liquidity. So yes, Canada has a lot of gold and Australia on the ground. But by the time you mine that gold and you bring it to the market, it might be too late for the crisis, okay? It's like if you had 17 houses around the world, but you don't have money to pay for food, okay? By the time you sell the houses, you're already dead, okay? So this is why countries are building their gold reserves. In a monetary crisis, the ones who have the most amount of, of physical liquid assets like gold will make the rules, will have the power. And that's actually why also that United States, which does not believe in gold, has not sold and it's still the second largest gold holder in the world after the European Union. So as we've heard a lot of speculation about a currency reset, I've heard you say before, Dan, that you use data to inform your position on such things. So did the explosion of debt due to the coronavirus push the possibility of this currency reset happening closer? Yes, yes. Actually, to tell you the truth, I've been following the gold and the foreign exchange markets, the gold, silver, and forex markets since uh, with my father uh, when I was young, since about 1965. But in the 1980s and 90s, as a speculator, I didn't do very much speculation and trading of gold and silver. I came back to, uh, I was more in the technology sector and in the 1990s and early 2000. In 2002, I dropped out of the stock market much earlier a little bit and I started uh, looking at what am I going to speculate from now on? Where am I going to go from here? So I took a some time off and do a lot of research. And an article in The Economist in 2002 attracted my attention to the global debt and to the U.S. debt. And that's when I said, oh my God, this is big trouble. And that's when I, after researching, not gold, but researching global debt for about six months, reading every possible book on debt and global debt, hundreds of years, I stopped and I said, now I understand the idea of debt. How do I play this game? And that's when I came and I said, it is real assets and gold is the most liquid one. Gold is not better than a house or land, real estate or a car or jewelry, but it is the most liquid of them, okay? In a period of crisis, of debt crisis. So that's when I became bullish on gold in 2002. It was around 300, 400 at that point. And that's when I came with my prediction that I said that gold would be somewhere around 5,000 in 15 years, around 15 years. We've passed 15 years right now. 
but I'm seeing signals that we will get. I'm not one of those who predicts uh, gold will be fifteen, thirty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. I think it's absurd, but I do see in the near future gold reaching somewhere around, let's say, four to six thousand dollars before you have an international monetary reset in some form or another. So that is linked to not just gold, but to real assets. So if you want to play the anti-debt, you go real assets. I'm not differentiating between real estate, your house, or gold or silver. The difference is only a question of liquidity. Keep some gold for liquidity. There is an old saying that the Swiss banks used to tell their clients before they got intoxicated with American economics in American MBA schools. There used to be a say with the Swiss, put 10% of your money into gold and pray God you'll never need it. Okay. The concept of that saying, which is old, uh, the Jewish people use the same concept. The Arab people and Indians, the idea behind this concept is to have some liquid assets because in a period of crisis, it doesn't matter that you have a Ferrari which is worth $25,000 or that you have a house in Palm Beach that's worth $5 million. You are not going to sell it in a crisis. In a crisis, you're going to sell the most liquid and gold is the most universal, marketable object that you can have. So it is not unique. There are other things, real assets, farmland, anything that's real. In a period of crisis, it's good to have. But the problem is in a period of crisis, as I said, you need fast liquidity because money degenerates at the speed of light. And in that situation, you need something that is the most marketable. And gold and silver have been the most marketable. And as we discussed yesterday uh, together, don't dismiss copper. And we have seen recently how much copper came back into the news. I can't read my newswire from Bloomberg and Reuters anymore without having a story on copper when for a few years nobody was mentioning copper. So those three metals have been for 10,000 years useful and most liquid and still available, they are not rare as people think about it. If gold was rare, it would have never been money. It is not abundant, but in sufficient quantity to serve as money. This is what an idea that crypto idiots don't understand, is that rarity kills anything that wants to be money. If it's rare, it will never be money or it will die the moment it becomes rare. Gold is not rare, but it is not in excessive quantity. On the other side, copper is very abundant, but it has been money, as much as silver, which also is abundant. But uh, while platinum and palladium, which are more rare, much rarer than gold, they have never been money. Why? Because they are so rare that nobody can get it, okay? So worldwide, you do not find platinum and palladium. You find a little bit in Canada, some in Peru, I think, and in South Africa and in Russia. But it's very difficult to mine. It is toxic in a certain way, contrary to gold and silver. And because of that, they've never became money because they were very rare. Gold, silver were not in abundance, but they were in very limited quantity, and the quantity of gold and silver mined moved proportionally with the increase in human population, which means that the amount of unit of account did not explode beyond necessity for social relations. So this is why gold in this debt crisis, it is not specifically gold, but it is the most liquid, the most marketable asset that you will be able to exchange and to exchange it for a house, for food, for something else. So when the debt crisis will collapse, debt forgiveness, that's what's going to happen. Real assets and the most marketable, the most liquid 
it will be the ones in demand. And that's the advantage of gold and silver compared to others which are as good like copper, oil, and real estate. Dan, you mentioned that you're watching some indicators that are informing, let's say, some of your decisions right now. So what types of indicators do you look at? Are they yields, ratios, currency markets, debt loads that you're paying attention to that are making you make some changes, let's say, in your portfolio at this time? Yeah, uh, be careful with correlations and positive or negative correlations. Uh, In finance, I've seen in the last 50 years, a lot of gurus who came to glory by applying a correlation like interest rates, uh, real interest rates to gold and inverse relation in this case, or the US dollar relation to gold. And the correlation, positive or negative, worked for a few years and all of a sudden uh, collapsed. Uh, Financial markets are complex systems. You cannot simplify them to uh, the two variables, X and Y relation. So be very careful with those. Uh, Right now, this correlation between interest rates, real interest rates and gold, negative correlation, it's almost perfect, uh, close to one. But be careful because there are other factors that go into, into account. What I follow the most right now is central banks. What are they doing with the printing of money, as we call it? Today, it's not printing, it's creating it digitally to infinity. And Bitcoin is being created and pumped up in price by fake digital uh, dollars called tethers. And there are a few others which they are printing it to infinity to support and to push the price of Bitcoin artificially. Central banks have been doing the same thing. I've been putting on Twitter every Saturday, the money supply M1, M2, and M3 compared to gold. And you can see that in the last year, there has been an explosion. Now, it's not enough to print the money for the states. They've been printing a lot of money, but in the last few years, what happened is that because of certain rules of the game of the central bank of the Federal Reserve, this money that has been printing has not been circulated. So the money flow has been dropping in the last few years very fast. So it's not enough for consumer inflation. You have monetary inflation because monetary inflation is the printing digitally of the currency in an excessive amount. But that's not enough to produce increase in prices of real prices, which we call, for the general public, we call inflation when prices go up. That's not inflation. Inflation is the excessive quantity of gold, silver, or dollars that are mined or created artificially or naturally above the necessity of human life for exchanges. That's called monetary inflation. So we had monetary inflation with digital dollars, but those digital dollars did not trickle down into the real economy, into salaries and into prices of real objects. Most of this money printing remain into an artificial digital casino exchanges, Wall Street and cryptocurrency exchange casinos, And it is moving around electronically, but it has not trickled into the real economy. So that's why you don't see consumer inflation as much, even though the inflation numbers that we see are completely manipulated. Inflation is not 2%. It is much closer to about 10% to 12%, if not 20% in the United States in US dollars. Okay? So... I'm watching the money supply. I'm watching the debt that goes up and the relation. And I'm, I'm also watching what central banks do. Are they going towards a new system? And is that system going Bitcoin, for example, or is it going US dollars or is it going into gold? And everything that I see, the data is clearly favoring gold. So I'm watching carefully right now the amount of gold reserves that are being accumulated. And I'm also watching what this Cold War that that is happening right now, that is geopolitics, between the United States and the pair, the team of China-Russia. 
They are working together, China and Russia. They are de-dollarizing their system. And Europe has been joining into de-dollarization process, not in the same way as China and Russia. So I'm watching to see the conversion and the drop, for example, in U.S. Treasury holdings by central banks. They have been dropping, even though there are still quite a lot of uh, U.S. Treasuries held by foreign banks. It's in foreign exchange. There are about 60 percent in the international uh, reserves, which includes also gold and SDRs. They are down to 50 percent. So they are dropping. And in international trade, if you look at the SWIFT data, the U.S. dollar now, it's at parity with uh, close to parity with the euro. That means in international trade, countries already use the U.S. dollar, but there is no more predominance of the U.S. dollar. It is now at equal footing with the euro. And the yuan, it's coming in, but it's very far, still very far behind. So what I'm watching for the price of gold is mainly the geopolitics and the central banks. What are they doing? And what happens with this war between the United States and China, Russia? Because it can trigger, you could have China today triggering the same event that France triggered in 1968 that drove a run into exchange of dollars into gold. It was done in an official way, going to the Fed and asking for uh, giving back U.S. dollars and asking for gold at thirty-five dollars. This is not happening. Uh, it's not going to happen today. Today, what's going to happen is China selling and India selling their U.S. Treasury reserves and buying gold in exchange for those treasuries. Now, they've been doing it very slowly and very smoothly, not to shake up the system too much. But if the Cold War extends, uh, goes ballistic between the United States and Russia, China, you might see China using, with the collaboration of Russia, but Russia doesn't have much uh, U.S. They already de-dollarized their reserves. So it's mostly China that now can do a shock the same way as France did in 1968 when it went to the Fed and said, here's your dollars, give me gold. Well, today, what China could do, the same thing is to collapse the dollar and asking for gold in exchange. Uh, Some people, Americans, believe that they wouldn't dare. Uh, The French dared in 1968 Uh, Be sure, and not only the French, but also the British, a few months after, a year after, actually, the French did it in 1968, and the British did it in 1971, when Nixon shut the window in front of their face. The Chinese could do the same thing, and that will collapse. It, It certainly collapsed the value of the British holdings of U.S. dollars, because the day that Nixon dealing the dollar from gold, the value of the uh, dollars that the British were holding in their hands collapsed 80% in about five years, okay? But it didn't stop people and also central banks to sell their dollars and exchange it into into gold. The same thing can happen now, but in this time, it's not going to be France, Great Britain, the Europeans. It's going to be China and maybe India that will sell their dollars for gold. And you are seeing this process, and that's what I'm watching now carefully. I look at what happens to treasury holdings by uh, global central banks. I watch, uh, you've seen, and I put a chart on Twitter a few days ago on Sunday, I think, where you can see that foreigners are selling or stopped slightly selling uh, U.S. treasuries, and the Fed buying And almost soon, if they continue the trend, the Fed will hold more treasuries than foreign central banks. And uh, like Hemingway said, when he was asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, at first slowly and then very fast. Okay, You are seeing the process now since 2008 of de-dollarization, but it is very smoothly and very slowly, but it could be in a kind of crisis 
that can be triggered by a geopolitical event or another crisis, a natural crisis, like a, a new explosion of another virus or this COVID virus evolving and restarting again, and you can have a collapse of the system and this slow selling of U.S. treasuries could go ballistic, like Hemingway said, at first it went slowly and then very fast. So I'm watching geopolitics signals. I'm watching the treasury holdings by foreign banks. I'm watching the printing of U.S. dollars because the future of the price of gold and indirectly of silver is based on that. I haven't talked very much. We haven't talked about silver too much. But silver in a monetary crisis relinks to gold and the correlation in good times between gold and silver drops, but not enormously, it doesn't go negative, but it drops to about 50%, the correlation, positive correlation with gold. And in monetary crisis, the correlation between silver and gold goes back close to 100%. So silver, you don't have to look at it very much in a monetary crisis, you just look at gold. What happens is that if gold explodes, Silver will follow gold, but it will follow on steroids. It will go, at the beginning, it will lag between gold, and then all of a sudden, it will, will go faster than gold in price increases. So in a way, silver is a poor man's gold, not in a very negative pejorative term, but it is very linked to gold. And if gold starts breaking up about 2000, you'll see silver starting to move even faster than gold on steroids. This is the way I see, and we've seen recently, the ratio of gold to silver has dropped with silver increasing much faster than gold. Excellent, Dan. We covered a lot of topics here today. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap up here? Uh, no, I think that we covered. Uh, uh, for those maybe who are interested in mining, uh, gold mining, precious metals mining, I don't cover individual uh, stocks. I look at uh, the gold stocks as a group in general. Mm -hmm. Gold stocks and silver stocks or uh, precious metal stocks before the collapse of Bretton Woods were leading. And the reason they were leading the market was because Americans couldn't buy gold before 1973. The only way to play the devaluation of the U.S. dollar, which many smart Americans were predicting, uh, some of them went to Switzerland and bought Swiss francs, which was linked to, the, to gold, and uh, they were buying gold in Canada or in uh, Europe. For Americans who couldn't do that, they bought uh, stocks. So precious metal stocks were leading indicator before the collapse of the Bretton Woods systems in 1971. This time around, because gold and silver are manipulated but free in a way on an exchange, and Americans today can buy physical gold and silver. They can also buy it through all kinds of electronic instruments like crypto gold and ETFs and mutual funds and other forms which did not exist before 1971. Today, mining companies, gold mining, are not a leading indicator. They will do like silver. Once the price of gold gives the signal, they will start moving up very fast and maybe at one point outperform physical gold, just like silver will outperform uh, physical gold. But that is not at the beginning. So don't expect at the beginning, if you look at the price of uh, precious metal stocks, you have individual ones that have done very well if you're a good analyst, if you are a good trader. But otherwise, as a group, they didn't perform very much and with quite a lot of volatility since 2000. And if you compare with uh, buying physical gold since 2000, you would have been much better into gold or physical uh, silver. But do not dismiss also gold mining and silver mining uh, stocks when all this breaks out. It could be with a big bang uh, when it happens. Excellent, Dan. Of course, you post a ton of charts on your Twitter. That's Popescu, P-O-P-E-S-C-U-C-O on Twitter. Anywhere else you'd like to point our listeners to? I think it's the best one because I'm also trading. 
and I do research for clients and Twitter allows me to be uh, very brief, uh, very fast. And I put a lot of information on Twitter, not only mine, but other people, when I see research interesting, I read it first. All the tweets, uh, retweets that I do, I always read the story before. I have access to the different databases and one newswire. So I first read it. And if I find it interesting, even if it disagrees with my own point of view, if it's very well stated, I put it up on my Twitter. So those who want an hourly and a very fast update, they can go through my uh, feed. On the other one, on LinkedIn, I, I put it, but much less regular. It doesn't allow me to do it as fast because I can do Twitter while uh, trading at the same time. Excellent, Dan. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure too. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.